Welcome to Saturdays at 7, Christian Scholars Review's conversation series with thought leaders about the academic vocation and the relationship that vocation shares with the church. My name is Todd Rehm. I have the privilege of serving as the publisher for Christian Scholars Review and as the host for Saturdays at 7. I also have the privilege of serving on the faculty and the administration at Indiana Wesleyan University. Our guest is Edgardo Clone Emmerich, the Irene and William McCutcheon Professor of Reconciliation and Theology, the Director of the Center for Reconciliation, and Dean at Duke University Divinity School. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My pleasure. It's wonderful being with you. After earning a bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering, you embraced a calling to prepare for ordained ministry. Would you please start by describing that process of discernment? It was a process of discernment that began with a big surprise, because that was not why I came right. to study in the United States. I came to study engineering. Yeah. And it was while studying engineering and at Cornell University, I had an encounter, uh, the, my call, uh, a, an encounter uh, with, with faith in new ways on Library Slope, what is called Life Slope by, by Cornell campus with a fellow classmate who introduced me to Jesus in new ways and led to a moment of affirmation of faith and of understanding my life as a human being and then also as a student. And so the, it began, that, that, that moment is not exactly conversion, but perhaps a reformation for me and a reformation that led me to examine engineering and, and, ha and to ask questions about what kind of engineer could I be uh, and could I not be. And so I moved from mechanical engineering to biomechanical engineering for graduate school. And then uh, while finishing my thesis, a master's thesis, I received a call to ministry. And that call to ministry came through my wife, of all people, who at a dinner conversation, uh, as I was wrestling with questions around what would I do after I finished my master's in engineering and, and what is God asking from me as a a servant, then she said, well, maybe God's calling you to ministry. And when she said those words, uh, it, it all clicked. Wow. It clicked and it, it showed me that this was in fact what God had been asking me to do. When I, my wife said, maybe God is calling you to ministry, truly was an answer to prayers and the questions I've been wrestling with. Wow. And the first reaction I had was one of joy and peace that this is the path. And then fear because <laughs> I had no idea what this could mean. I'd yeah. never thought about this. No one in my family was a pastor. And now here I was considering and, and then going to meet the pastor to say, I think God is calling me to ministry. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. While you've served as a faculty member at Duke since 2007, administrative duties have always been part of your efforts, including your service as the director of the Hispanic House of Studies and as the director of the Center for for reconciliation. In 2020, 2021, you were appointed to your first term as Dean of the Divinity School. Would you please describe the process of discernment that led to your calling that now includes administrative commitments that, dare I say, likely far exceed those that which would be deemed full-time? When I began working at the Divinity School, I began really with an understanding that I was going to be a professor. Hmm. And it, and yes, administration had always been part of my role at Divinity School. And so I did not simply see myself as someone who would be teaching and writing books, but also someone who would be developing programs and seeking to expand the mission of the school. But it was not really that I had a discernment that I was called to be a dean in quite uh, that way. It was more about being available. And I remember one occasion in particular when I was in Central America, actually, a conversation in a hotel room with colleagues from Central America, from the Methodist Church in Central America, in March 2020, so right before the pandemic. We were talking about, about our work in Central America, where I've been teaching uh, from the Divinity School for 10 years uh, uh, at that time. And the sense I had that a new chapter, I was coming to a new chapter, that there would be opportunities for discernment whether I would apply to become a dean of the Divinity School. Mm -hmm. But it was simply a consideration, 
and I was not sure that I would. Uh, but I did have a sense that a certain that a chapter of my life was drawing to a close, and a sense of loss uh, with that, and, hmm. and, and uh, appreciation and, and and giftedness because my time in work with the Central American Methodist Church uh, and and theological education deeply formed me. It, it formed my research. Uh, it informed my spirituality and my understanding of leadership. And then pandemic. And then uh, soon after that, in February 2021, then the transition of Greg Jones to Belmont University as president, then the invitation for me to become, become dean came from the provost. And I said yes to that. Yeah. But it was a surprise that I received that invitation because I was not expecting that transition at that time. I thought there might be a transition in several years, mm -hmm. and then I would consider whether I would apply for the deanship or not, but it didn't work out that way at all. It was really just kind of thrust uh, in, <laughs> on, onto me, or I was thrust into it, and, <laughs> and, and here I am now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. As you mentioned, in addition to your service to the church and the academy in the United States, you've offered theological instruction in Central America countries such as Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, also in Peru and Puerto Rico, uh, but also in Russia. In what ways, if any, did those experiences abroad shape your calling as a minister and shape your calling as an educator? They shaped my calling as a minister in the sense that it was continuing to a, a continuation of living out my ordination and my commitment in particular to the Methodist Church in which I was ordained as United Methodist, but then more broadly Methodism uh, in its various manifestations ar around the globe. And the experience of teaching in those settings, it was one of, of integration, of being a whole theologian. And by that, I mean that academic work and, and vocational identity and service to the church were very tightly interwoven in ways that were perhaps more compartmentalized in my life at Duke. And teaching in those locations was a time mm -hmm. of renewal and also a, a time of integration. And it was uh, that integration is something that informs my leadership now. But also as an educator, those experiences helped put my work in perspective. I'll give you one example. As I was working on my book, on Oscar Romero. Yeah. I did research at the Romero Center in El Salvador, where I was given a small office to, where I could set up my books and notebooks and laptop and work there for a few days when I was working in, in that library and, and center in El Salvador. In the little office where I was seated next to me were file cabinets uh, with uh, documents written by the Jesuit priests who have been killed at the oh. University of Central America in El Salvador because I was, that's where I was uh, studying, when that's where I was working. And the documents included papers that they had written, but there were also, in addition to documents, artifacts, pieces of grass bloodstained from the martyrs. Mm -hmm. And I had this clear sense of the smallness of what I was doing in terms of the, the significance yeah. of it. because. Yeah. I was working on the book that I was hoping would be published and would be my tenure uh, and would be complete my portfolio for the tenure process review. Yeah. And so the worst outcome I was fearing was, well, the book doesn't get good reviews uh, or my tenure is turned down. And I was seated, seated and studying at a place where the cost of discipleship yeah. had been displayed to the maximum. Yeah. And so it really put in perspective what I was about. Not as insignificant, it was, it was important, uh, but not of ultimate importance. And that is something that has stuck. For me. Yeah, thank you. That powerful story. Yeah, and I would say that book was published by Notre Dame Press. And as someone who has read it and benefited from it greatly, I'd strongly encourage others to read it. And I assume that it made for a successful tenure bid, too, uh, there at Duke University. So It, it did. Yeah. And, and it was a joy to work on that book. Yeah. And for me, a great debt of gratitude also for the people of San Salvador and Central America with whom I worked during those years. It was in some sense a book that was born from 
years of w- working and walking together. Yeah. And, and so for that reason, it's, it is important to me. Yeah. So yep. thank you. Yeah. Along those lines of Oscar Romero's legacy and working uh, and walking alongside people uh, who've experienced these kinds of challenges, I want to shift to talk about your work in terms of reconciliation uh, explicitly now. Reconciliation as a commitment is one that's central to your life and your administrative work. If I ask you to start, how do you understand it? How do you theologically define it and think through it? To begin with, it is a contested term. Yeah. Because uh, reconciliation has a troubled history mm. in how it's been used or abused. Yeah. And, and so there are cheap versions of reconciliation. And as I understand it, turn, of course, to the biblical witness as one primary source for shaping my understanding of reconciliation. And interestingly, it's a term that doesn't show up in the Old Testament very much. The analog term in the Old Testament perhaps would be shalom or peace. Mm. And it's really Paul in the New Testament that speaks of reconciliation and his understanding that certainly powerfully shapes mine of reconciliation. First and foremost, it's God's gift, as some God does. And then in response to that gift, there is a Christian responsibility to participate in, in the reception of that gift and in sharing it with others. And so for me, reconciliation and the work of a ministry of reconciliation began in my years as a church pastor here in Durham, as I was appointed to begin a Hispanic ministry, Hispanic mm-hmm. speaking congregation. My congregation was composed of chiefly uh, undocumented first-generation immigrants. And with that came many social challenges that affected them and vulnerabilities and at the same time gifts that they had. Yeah. And so the Ministry of Reconciliation was simply the ministry of being church in that setting and of seeking to, well, to announce what God's reconciliation with us and also the responsibility to be reconciled to each other as well. And that was really day in, day out work for us as we struggled to be a community together in amidst many social forces that would seek to uh, tear us apart and pit us against each other. Yeah. If possible to delineate then again, you, you speak of it as sort of contested term. Um, how does that understanding then compare to say one that might be understood within the broader culture here in the United States? In the broader culture in the United States, and I would say not just the United States, there can be an understanding of reconciliation in some cases as simply something between God and the soul. So mm. a, a, a vertical uh, transaction that sets me right with God, but changes nothing else. Mm. And so that I can be reconciled with God, but be unreconciled with people around me. So that's one understanding that's common in some Christian circles, a very individualistic one. And then also there, there can be accounts of social reconciliation that are more of let bygones be bygones. What happened in the past stayed there. Let's cover over the wounds, cover over the history, and just keep moving forward. And that too is a truncated vision of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Those understandings of reconciliation and those expressions of reconciliation are so prevalent that marginalized peoples and people who have been victims of systemic oppression are sometimes very resistant to the term reconciliation, and rightly so, if that is what is meant by reconciliation, if that is what has been practiced by reconciliation. And so the language, that's why I also say it's contested language, and some people for that reason think it's better to leave it aside and Hmm. look for new language. And I understand that impulse. At the same time, because I am pastor also and, and the minister of the gospel, and the term shows up in the scriptures, and throughout the Christian tradition, I don't want to simply abandon it, but mm-hmm. find ways of redeploying it, enriching it, and of course, more significantly, embodying it. Yeah. You mentioned that it's not just necessarily in the United States where that temptation, it, those temptations exist, uh, but in you know, locales perhaps around the world. How might, uh, if at all, uh, it differ, say, 
in a, in a country such as El Salvador that has seen some beautiful expressions of reconciliation, but has also experienced deep pain too. Absolutely. Deep pain that continues to this day. Yeah. And that exemplifies what the current Archbishop of San Salvador calls a pedagogy of violence that has been at work in the region really since the time of the conquest in the mm -hmm. 16th century. And in El Salvador and some other neighboring countries that have gone through civil wars, the language of reconciliation is associated with the language of amnesty mm -hmm. and also with the language of impunity. Amnesty accords that were signed that ended the civil war in El Salvador were more of a truce than a true reconciliation. Yeah. And so the association of reconciliation then with amnesty or with sim or with people being absolved of, of crimes is felt very keenly in the region. I remember once teaching in Guatemala, uh, on theology of reconciliation in the highlands of Guatemala that also experienced a civil war and terrible violence, particularly against the indigenous peoples and Speaking of reconciliation in that setting and trying to unfold it in the way that I do and we do here at Duke, where we also speak, when we speak of reconciliation, we also speak of lament. Mm -hmm. And for so, so many of my, my students in that class, lament was not part of their vocabulary uh, yeah. because a Christian should be someone who is always uh, full of joy mm -hmm. and, uh, and leave, leading a victorious life. And the idea of of making room for lament and for saying how long, O Lord, or questioning or, or, or giving air to the pain was not seen as something that was altogether Christian. It's a struggle to embody reconciliation in the, in the, in the Central American settings too, but you also have examples of it. And I think of course of the ministry of Oscar Romero yeah. and how he through his ministry, embodied reconciliation and preached it and practiced it as integral liberation, mm -hmm. meaning that liberation that involves all dimensions of the human being, not yeah. simply the, the social, but including also the transcendent liberation to be open before God and then also open before each other and being able to be liberated and freed from all the things that hold us back or that hold us in cycles of oppression and that free us to be fully alive. Yeah. And so, uh, Romero is, and his theological vision is for me, a beautiful articulation of a reconciliation that is not cheap reconciliation, yeah. but that is truly a gospel one that transforms or in his language transfigures the social conditions into something that resembles more the kingdom of God. Yeah. Thank you. With these temptations then existing in various ways as they do uh, in, in places and amongst people, in what ways, if any, does the church's understanding and practice of reconciliation need to consider particularities of culture, but then also maybe transcend particularities of culture in terms of the theological message that it tries to share? Culture is something that cannot be separated from the gospel, the church, from humanity. Theologians have spoken of culture as a second, something like a second nature. Yeah. Uh, it's habits that shape our perception and empower or inhibit certain kinds of actions. And think of the work by Justo Gonzalez, mm -hmm. a Latino theologian, who wrote of, uh, it, it's, in Spanish it works more neatly than in English, but of the relationship between culture, cultivation, and cult in the sense of worship. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, and these are tied historically as, as cultivation and the gathering in farming communities promotes the formation of a certain kind of culture. And then also the cult of offering God sacrifices from the first fruits of the yeah. cultivation. And so these are all etymologically related, but also in fact related through practices of the communities. When it comes into the gospel, the gospel is simply cannot help, but be an uncultured uh, yeah. reality. Uh, Gonzalez, again, in his Hispanic creeds, talks about Jesus Christ being 
becoming flesh in one culture for all cultures. Hmm. And, and that sense of the one for the many, the particularity uh, for the sake of the all. Yeah. And that, and that is true, I th think, for the gospel. The church is always attentive to culture because yeah. the church is an uncultured reality. And cultures are within the church, and the church finds ways in which relates to the diversity of cultures that it embodies and that are within it in complicated ways. Yeah. As gift, first of all, because it is, I think there are elements here of gift, but it's also a fallen gift. Mm. And as a fallen gift, it's one that also the, the marks of sin and of finitude are, are marked through it. And so the church needs to be attended to it in that way and not let itself either become culturally captive or somehow seek to aspire to a, being a, a cultural in mm. a way that is simply impossible because yeah. we are cultured beings. And so the church in that sense transcends any one particular culture. Yeah. And that is also the beauty of the church. I would say the miracle of Pentecost, mm. that in the day of Pentecost, you have this image of all people who gather from all nations of the world, and then the Holy Spirit falls, and the news are proclaimed, and everyone hears the news in their own native tongue. Yeah. And yet, the question is asked, are not all these Galileans? And, hmm. and for me, the question, well, why would they ask that? Well, it doesn't say, but one hypothesis I have is because they spoke in all these languages, but with a Galilean accent. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, because we always have some accent. Yeah. Uh, I have my accent, you have your accent, even as I'm speaking in English. And the accent uh, is an aspect of our history, of our particularity. And yet, it's one that, in speaking new languages, allows for communication, but without losing our accents. Yeah. And so, for me, that's also the church in engaging in different cultures, in not losing its Christian accent as yeah. it engages different cultures. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful and important distinctions. I want to transition back, if I may, to talk about uh, your duties as dean and the work that you do with the Divinity School. Earlier, I, I echoed that it's possible that those duties may amount to something that far exceeds that of a, a full-time responsibility or position. Um, but if possible to draw upon what might be identified as a typical day, if one may exist, what details demand your attention? This is a wonderful question. And actually, it's one of the things I love of being dean is the range and yeah. diversity of what I encounter in any given day. Just this week, I'll take a day this week where that began, where I had a, a Zoom call with some partners in South Africa as we we're exploring a, a joint program that we might do together in the summer. And then a meeting with a visiting scholar who was sharing stories from his time at Duke, Duke Divinity School, and which was a very powerfully transformative time because he was in the Duke Divinity School as someone in pursuing his studies in circumstances that were extremely challenging. I don't want to go into details right now, but, so, but an incredibly powerful and inspiring conversation with me to meet with this alum from many years ago. And then a meeting to talk about buildings. <laughs> and to talk about, about the room utilization and are there ways in which we can be more e efficient in our room assignments for classes and for offices. <laughs> and then I presided at a worship service. And after that, I had a meeting with the provost <laughs> and I had a, an evening dinner for, for some special group. And so it's an incredible range in one yeah. day. Yeah. And I find that to be very stimulating, uh, even if it can be a little bit head spinning. Yeah. No, thank you. That's quite a day there. Uh, what time then amongst those details is left for writing and teaching? Not much time <laughs> is left for writing and teaching. <laughs> yeah. And rightly so. Because that is not my chief role. It's, it's my chief role, I would see it in some sense as perhaps as a, uh, I'm going to a sports imagery as the coach is not my role to be on the court taking yeah. shots, but helping yeah. the players take shots. And yeah. so, and as Dean, uh, helping other scholars advance their scholarship and students 
uh, to grow as scholars and, and, and pastors. So on the one hand, it shouldn't be that I have vast amount of time for mm -hmm. that work. On the other hand, I do still make time for writing because it's important that my leadership have also continue to have its theological and intellectual depth uh, wells being renewed mm -hmm. and also to teach both because the coursework is needed and, and, and I can teach it uh, and also because it's a way of connecting with students as well for me and of engaging students in, in other ways, even as I am dean and I'm, I don't have as many opportunities for being in the classroom or, or, or if hanging out or something like that with students. The teaching is one way of doing that. So there are many goods to it. So I still do it, but not as much as I had before. And I, yeah. and I shouldn't be doing yeah. it as much as I was before. Have your teaching and writing interests changed, if at all, since becoming dean? Um, have you added questions to those, those areas of exploration? Yes, I would say that the teaching focuses on areas, okay, what is really needed mm. in the curriculum that I am well suited to teach. Yeah. Uh, so not exploring, I'm going to teach a course on something that might interest me in particular, but it's a small, limited elective in terms of, or a small group of people, no, uh, they would be core curricular requirements. And as far as writing, then the, the focus would be on writing that advances the vision for the school mm -hmm. or that resources the church. Yeah. And so that it connects in that sense to the mission of the school as well. Yeah. And so less in say my guilds, uh, guild writing, but yeah. more for the church. Yeah. Public representation of the divinity school and its mission and the needs of the church and intersection with it. Yeah. Yes. And the creation of generation of resources, for example, for the Methodist church in particular. Yeah. Uh, both as my church and as an important constituency uh, for the Divinity School. Yeah. Thank you. As with much of education, the availability of digital platform, platforms, excuse me, has impacted theological education and preparation for ordained ministry. In what ways have you and your colleagues determined when to embrace the usage of such platforms versus resisting their usage? We embraced various modalities years ago yeah. uh, we began what we call our hybrid programs which involve weeks of uh, residency three times a year intensive weeks and then followed by online work in mm -hmm. between sessions so that kind of hybrid modality that is not fully online but semi-residential and i've been teaching in that modality since we began okay. on, over 10 years ago so it's not new but it's increased in terms of its, in terms of the offerings that we have in those, those modalities and the number of students in those modalities. And we are still trying to learn how to not simply embrace modality, but how to embrace this more complex community mm -hmm. where around 50% of our students are full-time residential and 50% are semi-residential, meaning that they're in the hybrid programs mm. and how to embrace both uh, in their diversity and offer programs that are equally excellent, even yeah. if they're different in how they are provided. And so that's where we are currently find our, finding ourselves. And in terms of things that we are determined to resist, at one level, resistance is futile if we're thinking <laughs> that we can simply uh, uh, say, we're, I will not use some kind of uh, online modality. We are using one right now. And, and we have them in our pockets uh, and we're carrying them with us all the time. What we are trying to do instead is to understand better what can happen only in residence, what mm -hmm. can happen perhaps best in residence, what can also happen online and can happen very well online and, yeah. to, and to have therefore clear expectations for each modality for ourselves and then for our students too. Thank you. When you look across the landscape of theological education as it's practiced here in the United States, what would you presently identify as the greatest opportunities for the formation of ordained ministry? There are many opportunities. Mm -hmm. One of the opportunities that I'm very interested in and that I think at a place like Duke is, is an opportunity that's very significant for us. And in saying this, I'm 
think that w the opportunities will vary according to where you're located. But located at a place like Duke is for me, one of the opportunities I see is the formation of uh, pastors who can empower lay ministry for beyond the walls of the church. Hmm. And what I mean by that is to help develop a theology of the professions hmm. that allow us to help us think of what does it mean to be a Christian who is a physician, who is a lawyer, who is hmm. an entrepreneur, uh, who is a public policy expert, and to not have compartmentalized lives where you, you, you go to church on Sunday, but then you're professional doing this other work throughout the week, and perhaps as a kind person and as a Christian person, but to have greater integration uh, and that allows for a more creative living out of our baptismal ministry throughout different kinds of work that we do. And at a place like Duke is then thinking, okay, what does it mean to have more connections between divinity and law? Yeah. Uh, divinity and ecology, divinity and business. And I see tremendous opportunities there for forming lay ministers and also mm -hmm. for forming the pastors who will equip the saints for the work of ministry, not simply for Sunday school. Yes, that's important for serving in, in the worship services and, and in the being ministries of the church, but also in a sense to take the gospel out into the workplaces in ways that are appropriate for their vocation. I assume that this uh, positioning of the divinity school within the university is part of what's led to an increasing number of joint appointments, joint programs, but then also centers that sort of exist at the intersections between professional schools and the interests of those schools. Absolutely. And an example of that would be our Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative, mm -hmm. where we have people who are jointly appointed in the School of Medicine and Divinity School. Yeah. And where we are offering programs where we have uh, divinity students and healthcare providers uh, yeah. studying uh, how practice of healthcare can be embodied and lived in, in new ways when we consider God's love. Yeah. Uh, it's practicing healthcare as a practice of God's, extending God's love to the world. Thank you. What then are some of the greatest challenges to the formation for ordained ministry? There, there are challenges. One of the challenges is that there is a decline in mm. vocations toward a ministry. Mm. And an aspect of that decline has to do with the ways in which the church is seen not as, a, as the body of Christ, but as a problem. And we see that our students who are coming to us are coming with vocational on clarity and mm -hmm. they're not clear in their vocation. And to the extent that they're clear, they tend to lean and gravitate more towards nonprofit and other kinds of ministries of social work that are very important, yeah. but that seem to them to be more life-giving and perhaps more socially impactful than ordained ministry in a parish setting. Yeah, And at the same time, recognize that that's a cultural trend that we are facing, we still believe that training of preachers in the language of the, the original Duke University indenture or the formation of pa ordained ministers or pastors for the church is fundamental to our service to the church because it is in the local congregation through these pastors that people are baptized, that they encounter, uh, that people receive the, the Lord, the body of Christ, uh, that they are also led in the worship of God. On the, and I suppose on the other hand, I think another challenge that we have is the cultural clericalism. That hmm. in the, that as as the ordained ministry is finds itself challenged from many places, there can be a protective spirit to try to preserve hmm. ministry in some sense in and for itself, yeah. rather than seeing no the ordained ministry is for the sake of the body of Christ as a whole and for the sake of the laity, of the, the nows, the people of God. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned that the Divinity School exists as a school of the church, as well as a school of the university. Um, and so in the time that we have left, I want to focus uh, our attention on some of these kind of questions that come up uh, during in that relationship. 
as the dean, in what way do those commitments impact your understanding of the Christian academic vocation that you carry and also your colleagues carry uh, on the faculty? Duke Divinity is clearly a school of Duke University, and it is accountable to the church. And I think the distinctions there are also significant. I, and I experience those distinctions myself. I am a dean employed by Duke University. I am also an ordained elder of the United Methodist Church who is appointed by the bishop. Mm. And my primary identity vocationally is the latter one, that I am an ordained minister appointed by the bishop because I made vows, solemn vows that bind me to being the order of elders and mm -hmm. that the bishop can say, now we want to send you here. And I would then need to either go or break my vows. Yeah. And so, the, so I, I certainly feel those uh, different locations and vocations in a sense in, in me. But I do think that for our, our faculty and for ourselves too, that we are a, we are a school for the church. Hmm. We're not the church and we are for the church. And being for the church requires a relative degree of independence from the church, hmm. precisely for the sake of being for it. Yeah. And that gap uh, of the relative independence that is also relational is also where there's room for our mission to be one that can be a source of reform and renewal for the church. Mm -hmm. Even as we're also seeking to be attentive to what is it that the church is saying to us, that, yeah. that it needs from us. So it's, it's a dialogue, but the, but, and the dialogue requires some distance so that it's not simply collapsing into identity. We talked earlier about some of the benefits that come to the Divinity School and other professional schools by virtue of the relationships that they can share through programs, through faculty, through centers and operations as such. Uh, what are some of the challenges uh, that may come to the Divinity School that other professional schools may not experience? I think the challenges that come to us can be a number of them. On the one hand, that disagreements among us can be perceived as matters of eternal significance hmm. because we are dealing with subjects that are deeply, not just personal, uh, but existential uh, as, as in terms of speaking of the gospel and its interpretation and things that go deep to our sense of who we are and whom we have been called to be. And so I think that there's a way in which, again, our, our uh, vocation can be comprehensive in ways that in some others, in some other professional schools, not to the same degree. Uh, yeah. So I think that that's, that is a difference. I also think that same time that the challenges that the Divinity School faces that other schools don't experience well, would also be things related to our changing climate, that we are, in a, in, we are living in an increasingly secularized society where the fastest growing group are the non-religious affiliated, and that impacts our enrollment in ways that don't impact the enrollments of other schools at Duke University, where there are many, many more people applying that could ever be admitted. Uh, and that's not true uh, to the same way extent for us. I also think that we are able to do some things that other schools can't do as mm. well. And that this university was established with the motto of eruditio et religio, you know, learning and faith. Yeah. And we are able to embody those as a school in ways that are, frankly, much more difficult for other schools to do. And in some ways have also a task and a mission of lift, continuing to lift this vision, this integral vision to the university as a whole as saying, this is actually at the heart of the school. This is part of our DNA to mm -hmm. weave together learning and faith. And also at the same time to recognize that by themselves, these are not sufficient, that there needs to be a sense of service or of mercy yeah. that, that shapes the work that we are engaged in in terms of our research and our teaching in addressing and, and tending to the wounds in the world around us. 
And so I think that that's also an aspect where the Divinity School can make a very important contribution uh, to the university around us. Thank you. As we close our time together today, I want to ask you about the intellectual, moral, and, the and or theological virtues that you believe may prove essential uh, to the faithful exercise of the Christian academic vocation uh, for you as the dean, but also for you and your colleagues. For me as dean and for us, our colleagues, we're first of all Christians mm -hmm. in, terms, in terms of our ethos. Yeah. And because of that, in a sense, all the virtues are needed. We, we may favor for our life together the intellectual virtues of creativity and insight, ins insight and of eloquence in writing and, and speech. But we also need to couple those with humility and honesty and and, and courage, and also uh, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, the uh, theological uh, account, the theological virtue. And they are all interconnected. They, they grow together and they reinforce each other. I think of, for example, the, the Duke University has as one of its strategic goals, empowering the boldest thinkers. Hmm. I think of how it is that, say, uh, Aquinas, said something along the lines that the praise of courage depends on the virtue, on the justice of a cause. Yeah. And, and so empowering the boldest thinkers, praising the praise of the boldest thinkers will depend on the, not simply on the boldness, but on the justice of their thinking. Yeah. And I think that's also the kind of virtues and, and holistic view that we aspire to be forming and that we struggle to be, to form that well. But there is that sense of, all the virtues being needed. And in that sense, a Pentecost vision. Yeah. Again, the day of Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit is poured in tongues of flame. And I think of the gifts of the Spirit in Isaiah and the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. And this, perhaps a sense of the, the life of the Spirit being needed to inform, inflame the life mm -hmm. of the mind in, in a way that is one that is hopeful for society that provides healing uh, for society, and that also draws us, of course, more deeply into the mind of God. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, may that uh, that uh, vision always be at the forefront of how we think about uh, the practices for formation that we offer our colleagues, and how we in turn go out and serve the world. Thank you. Our guest has been Ngardo Cologne Emmerich, the Irene and William McCutcheon Professor of Reconciliation and Theology the director of the Center for Reconciliation, and dean at Duke University Divinity School. Thank you for taking the time to share your insights and wisdom with us. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful being with you. Thank you for joining us for Saturdays at 7, Christian Scholars Review's conversation series with thought leaders about the academic vocation and the relationship that vocation shares with the church. We invite you to join us again next week for Saturdays at 7.